Good morning. This is John Coates here in Natick, Massachusetts. This tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Program. This is January 22nd, 2001. <clears throat> and this morning we are pleased to have with us James Smith. Jim, how are you today? Hi. I'm going to make a prefatorial announcement here because um, this is an unusual tape and we're looking forward very much to uh, putting it in our archives. <clears throat> Jim, you were uh, taped here about a year and a half ago, I believe. That's right. And um, I urge everyone uh, listening to this today to go back and look at Jim's first tape where he talked to us about combat in Africa, in Sicily, and in Italy. Right. Um, he was awarded the Purple Heart for uh, action at uh, Monte Cassino and the Bronze Star for action at Monte Patano in Italy. Both of these actions resulted in uh, wounds um, and s time in hospitals, um, time to think about what happens to troops in battle as an officer. You were a first lieutenant by this time? Yes, I was. Um, and you said you wanted to talk to us today about emphasis on combat fatigue and hospital experiences in the Army, something we very seldom get to on these tapes, and we welcome your thinking about coming back and talking to us today. I'm going to let you lead this in interview. I see you have a lot of notes there. Yeah. Where would you like to begin after your awards of these medals or after being wounded? Or do you want to tell us about being wounded and the result of that? I, I thought uh, first I should uh, tell, just briefly tell, um, you know, why, why I, I think I know what I'm talking about. In other words, who am I and what and where was I so that uh, someone watching this tape would, uh, would understand that I do know what I'm talking about. I was in, I served in North Africa, Sicily, and Italy. I was not in the infantry, so I imagine the infantry soldiers' experiences are a little more hectic than I, but I was a forward observer. I'm a forward observer, somebody that's out on a hill somewhere where he can see the front lines and see what's going on, and yet he remains hidden. I was the eyes for uh, our 12 guns and the 12 guns from the 1st Battalion, so uh, I, would, I could call in targets of opportunity, and when the infantry attacked, I could uh, help them with artillery fire. But probably what isn't recognized, the fact is that I was an observer. Jim, when you say... For First <clears throat> battalion. What what division were you in? I had a, we were, I was part of the 17th Field Artillery Regimental Regiment. We were Corps Artillery. Most people don't know what that means, but a, a infantry division is an entity all by itself. It can fight. It's got everything, even down to a chaplain and a dentist. Now sometimes the division was thrown into a position any position where they couldn't handle it and needed help. We were the help. We were the core artillery, and therefore we were moved from one area to another area, which kept, which kept the regiment in action almost all the time. So you were a floating artillery right, that's group. That's right. Okay. Before you tell us about what you did as a forward observer, tell us how you were trained to be a forward observer? Well, I, I, uh, I was sent to an a officer's uh, training camp down at Fort Sill, and there we were uh, fired artillery uh, with fire, uh, fire missions where uh, we'd look out over a, a field and uh, the instructor would say, there's enemy near that tree, and you had to get artillery fire. You, the, actually, the guns fired, 
and you had to observe it and get it in the right location. You were directing the gunners. Right. Of, okay. But, uh, you know, there's no way to prepare you for the real thing. So that when I, I felt when I got overseas, I was kind of poorly trained. I, I shot a rifle a very few times, and it seemed to me like we were rushed in as quickly as possible because they needed persons. They For needed the benefit soldiers. Of, the benefit of historians, can you tell us when you went overseas? I went over, uh, um, it's, uh, I guess it was about uh, January of 43. I had been, in, I, I joined the Army in uh, 40, May of 42, and I had uh, training down at Fort Sill, a little bit of basic training at Fort Bragg, and then I volunteered for overseas duty and I arrived at Casablanca and we were rushed up to Tunisia like, you know, like we were gonna help win this war. So I, I, I'm not, I, I would knock my training. I don't think anybody is trained right to, to face this and we certainly weren't. And we were up against the best the Germans had the African Corps with Rommel as their commander. And we felt about like this <laughs> compared to them. So uh, uh, I want to get into any other question on that? No, okay. I, I, I take it you uh, uh, from Africa. Uh, you went to Sicily. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I urge you to uh, okay. just keep on your track here. The, um, the, the, when we were going overseas and you're on your ship, you know, you, you talk about how, how you're going to behave. Uh, you know, what are you going to do in, in face of the enemy? Uh, you haven't experienced yet, you are not up there yet, but uh, it's, <clears throat> a real, it's a real uh, consideration. And we talked about it, you know, would we uh, run, would we cry, I saw men cry, would you curl up in a place and not function, or would you do your job? And most soldiers did their job. Were you an officer at this time? I was an officer at this time. And did you sit with your, uh, your men assigned to you and, and have these discussions? Or was this um, just among officers? No, no, just private, like, you know, we were at Camp Kilmer and we'd go, we'd go out and drink a few beers and talk about how we're gonna behave. So uh, every soldier, I think, has that in back of their mind, how they're going to, uh, how they're going to uh, face the enemy. How did you think you would behave? I, I don't know. I uh, hoped I would, and I did. My first, I, I was sent up to the last hill, and, and when I got there, you know, I, I I couldn't hardly function. I was my my mind was on the fact that on the next hill is the enemy. And I had a hard time overcoming that at first. Is this to in, even this function is in Italy. It was in North Africa. North Africa, and and then we went up on a hill. But uh, you know, with regard to going up on a hill and the other men going up on that last hill, uh, how how could we do it? Um, how could men go up a hill and in face of enemy fire? When the, when the uh, you know, in, in war or in a battle, uh, most, most time the, the soldiers don't aim. You know, the enemy's moving around, so you just spray. Machine guns just spray, and the individual soldiers just shoot. So you don't really have any idea where you're, where you're gonna get shot, or this guy next 
next to you is going to get shot, or where you're going to get shot. It's just a, it's like a, a matter of luck. So it's, it's hard to get yourself to go up a hill in, in the face of something like that. You know, you can't really protect yourself. And, and why would men go up a hill in face of uh, that kind of fire? Well, I claim that uh, they went up the hill not to save their country, and they didn't go up the hill to, uh, because they hated the enemy. They went up the hill because of camaraderie. The, the soldiers that they with, were with lived very close together, lived 24 hours a day you're with these men. And, and uh, you have to be respected. You have to face them, and they have to face you. You know, I might say the greatest critic is, is, the, is the guy next to you and yourself. So if, if they go up a hill and you don't, you know, the next day, how are you going to face those men? They're all going to know. <clears throat> There's no way to hide. There's no way to avoid it. You have to go if you're going to gain their respect. Jim, and you were there instances where I, I'll tell you a group went up a hill and somebody didn't? What happened to that guy? I'll tell you. I, this is another thing I've never heard. One day, one day in North Africa, back at the guns, these four guys appeared from out of nowhere. And one questioned, and I never questioned them very much. They were infantry, and they said they were lost. Well, we, we all knew what had happened. And we were in the artillery, and we knew what the infantry was up against. So that, uh, you know, we, who, who are we to criticize them? But we knew that they had not gone up the hill. And getting lost means that they wandered away. So the captain, my captain, was a pretty generous guy. He says, well, we'll leave them stay here for a couple of days. We fed them. They slept in our gun crew and hung around with them all day. But he said, uh, at the second day, he says, they have to go. And so we went and told them. And the next morning, they were gone. Now. What are they going to face? Now, those soldiers that wandered off got to go back. They got to find their outfit and, and report in. Because if they don't, they're going to be listed as missing. And first thing you know, that missing goes to Army headquarters and goes home. Oh, those four guys aren't going to want that. So they're going to go back. All right, they get eaten out by the officer and they get yelled at by the sergeant. But that isn't what they feared. They feared his, their friends. Everyone in that platoon knew what they did. Now they have to f literally face up to this. You know, after, after you've been through an ordeal and you all measured up, you, you would sit on a hillside and uh, you didn't talk about the fighting that just took place. You kidded and joked with one another about somebody being a redhead and somebody else from Texas. But there was a camaraderie there. They respected you and you respected them. And you've got to have that. Now these four men are going to have to go back. And they're not going to be able to tell some kind of a story like, you know, it was dark and I, they can't do that. So what are they going to have to do? The next time, they're going to have to go. And the next time, they're going to have to show everybody in that platoon that uh, they're worthy of uh, <clears throat> everyone's friendship. Isn't it going to be worse for them that they have to prove themselves That's right. over it's and be above? Worse. That's going to be worse. This, this is something from another outfit though, that you just described. What about your outfit? Did you witness anything? Do you know anybody who didn't measure up? No, I don't. I saw soldiers run in my outfit. Uh, you know, the, the gun crew 
pretty much anchored there. You weren't allowed to leave. We had a couple Joes. One time they went up on Mount Pantana because there was a whole lot of German dead up there. And you know, they were after wristwatches and they stumbled on a minefield and they were both killed. So you, you had to stay right with your gun battery. And there was a sergeant and a corporal who were charged. No, I didn't see anybody run. And I'll, I'll give you another example. No, no, explain what you just said. Uh, a sergeant and a corporal were charged. In charge of them. Oh, in charge. Yeah, and there Sorry. was about no. six cannoneers. I had, I and my crew really had a chance to, you know, to float around. I just had a crew of, I had a, three wiremen and, a, and one of those wiremen was a radio man. That's all I had responsibility for. And they would run out my wire and I would find a place to go during the day and sometimes even get shot at trying to, trying to find a place where I knew where our infantry was and I knew where the enemy was. And I would find a place and then uh, I'd crawl away and get behind a wall or something. Then at night they would run up my wire and attach up my phone and set up my radio. And then they would go and they would stay somewhere between me and headquarters. My phone went right to headquarters. I got to know headquarters men better than some of my own officers in the battery. And then if my wire was knocked out, one of my crewmen would run up my wire, find the break, repair it. That was their job. Now those men, I never saw them back off from anything. In fact, more than once I had to warn them about being a little too careless, you know, exposing themselves to fix a wire which we could wait it till dusk or something like that to fix. You no, were never in, saw. You were in an, a forward, exposed position right, all by the yourself time. all the time. Uh, could you get back out of there, or were you uh, a great target for the Germans? Yeah, I had to. I, I figured that uh, movement would give me away. If I if I took a shovel full of earth out to make my foxhole deeper, I hid it. Every can of sea ration I ate, I hid it. In fact, when I chose my OP, I chose it where there would be, in Italy you had a lot of these, uh, a fe like a fence put up out of stone. And I even chose a place where I could hide, where I could crawl over and relieve myself and things like that. But I sat there all day long with my scope, which was two ears sticking up, and I sat right on the end of my foxhole, and I stayed there a month, a month at a time. That's what I want to talk about, battle fatigue, and how it started to get to me. But uh, that was their job. No, I saw, I saw soldiers run down off of Mount Pantano, but they regrouped on a lower hill and went back up again. But the idea of these lost soldiers, that happened twice. And uh, I use that as an example. Uh, there were some, I don't know whether you call that cowardice or not. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. You said you were out there a month at a time? Yeah. How could you be, be supplied? Oh, How did I, you get your food? Yeah, they, my crew, my crew, <coughs> you know, my crew were, uh, you know, a close-knit group. Oh, sometimes a man would crawl up to me, one of my men would crawl up to me and, and climb for maybe an hour to get to me and give me a cup of coffee. They climb all the way up and give me a Thanksgiving dinner, a Christmas. I was in the same place at Christmas from Thanksgiving. I lived out like that all alone. And the infantry was down in front of me, it's true. And I went down there many a time <clears throat> because uh, what was going on down there greatly affected me. 
And then there was a church, a abandoned church, Catholic church. I used to go down there not to pray, but to meet somebody, talk to somebody, just for camaraderie. And then, then uh, you know, the elements. If, if it was raining and there was a lot of fog, you know, what am I going to see? Nothing. And I knew that on that Mount Pantano there was a German officer, young guy just like me, who was doing the same thing. He was looking, looking, trying to spot me. Could I'm you trying spot to him? Spot. Never. No. Never. Never. Did they, anybody prepare you for the loneliness? <laughs> no, no. And maybe, maybe if I would have complained, but I'm an, I was not that kind of guy. They, like, like in North Africa and Sicily, where things were very fluid. You know what I mean by fluid? Mm -hmm. You didn't know exactly where the enemy was. The enemy in Sicily was trying to get out. They didn't want a, a showdown. And in Africa, uh, Hitler abandoned Africa so that we captured piles of Germans. And the Germans retreated until they couldn't retreat no more. But in Italy, nothing moved day after day after day. And, you know, at the, in the front lines there, when it gets to dusk, you know, what are you going to do? So I find myself going to sleep at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. What am I going to do, uh, read a book or something? There was nothing, nothing to do. And I would sleep on that mountainside all night long, well, much as I could. And the, and the infantry had to do the same. But then you were up in the morning, 4, 5 o'clock. Yes, I spent a lot of time alone, and I had a chance to, you know, think, what am I going to do if, if this happens or that happens? If what happens? What were your fears? Ah, uh, enemy patrol. That was my fear. I was sitting on the edge of my foxhole. My foxhole was narrow. I made it as narrow. And if you made it too deep, it got water in it. So uh, I sat right in, and they would have to, they would have to drop a shell literally in that hole to get me. And I was sitting on the edge, I'd just slip in. And if, if they fired at me again, unless they got me with the first burst, in fact, that's true of most guys. If you, if you fired at the enemy and you didn't get them the first shot, you're not going to get them. They're going to fall on the ground. They're going to hide. And, and uh, so I wasn't afraid of that, but I was scared to death of enemy patrols and they were around. When it's dark out there, I mean it's dark, and you're up on a mountain and you're by yourself, did things go bump in the night and did you think you heard people coming oh, toward sure. you? How did your own men approach you without being shot? Well, we had a, uh, we had, what they call them, a password. You know, cats, paw, uh, Stan the man, or uh, Joe Lewis, you know, but <laughs> Again, I'm not going to use that. I'm not going to call out if I hear something, some disturbance on a hillside. I, yeah, I think oh, that would not be a good idea. No, sir. And even down with the infantry, they're not going to do that. But it sounds good. And maybe uh, back in the rear area, it, it, it could be important. But I'm not going to. I'm not going to give myself away. Oh, yeah, I woke up at night. I woke <clears> up at <throat> night uh, down in the valley. The infantry, they had what they called a firefight. Now, a firefight was not designed to attack anybody, nor were you to get yourself killed. A firefight was to make sure that the enemy was over there where they're supposed to be. So you send a couple men out with a, 
automatic weapons and they would spray bullets all over the place, make a whole lot of noise. And what they wanted was a response from the enemy. Then they knew the enemy was there and wasn't trying to pull some sneaky trick. We had firefights where the, the tracers would bounce off and bang all over the place. I'd wake up as soon as I heard the German answer, and the German gun was different than ours. I'd go back to sleep. And, and you probably will say, uh, I suppose the enemy doesn't uh, play ball. <laughs> That's my next question. They're going to play the game. Yeah. If, if they don't answer, you might get the idea of attacking. And, and since some general back somewhere didn't order them to, to attack, they, they want to live and they want to see the sun come up the next day. So they'll play the game. They'll fire back. And then our couple of guys would come back, go back to sleep. Oh, we had, we had guards, yes. I was the one that didn't have any guards, but they had uh, guards walking all the time. So that uh, it was like a game, some aspects of it. Like, uh, how far apart are you going to go from the enemy? Well, it didn't pay to get too close. It didn't pay for either side to get too close. How could you read your mail if the enemy was over the distance of that church, that's too close. So they, they played the game too. If you, if, if you could get, uh, you go <clears throat> to this edge of the field where there's a hill or there's a little foliage, trees, somehow you felt safe. And the enemy did too. You never walked out in the open. That was a no-no. Even though maybe one guy or two guys are not even going to fire at, the enemy is going to fire at. You just didn't do it. But if, if you were behind a little slope, you, you behaved altogether different. And, and the enemy knew you were behind the slope. So we, we stayed kind of far apart. Jim, strategically, the United States Army was trying to move north, up, up Italy, and the German Army was trying to keep you from right. moving north. Right. But you're describing the stalemate, That's like what it was. like nobody's moving. Oh, the, is this Mark Clark in the Fifth Army? Yep. Yeah. Uh, wasn't there pressure for you guys and to keep was going from time to when we first went into Italy? It was just like that. We sat over here, and they sat over there. They didn't want to fight. They didn't want a battle. The enemy, the, I think the German soldiers knew that they were not going to get replacements. They were going to have to hang here with what they had. And uh, the replacements were going to go to D-Day or some other place. But I, I think under pressure, the high command had to do something. That's why. I, I wrote stories about some of this, and I thought it was a, a worthless mountain, Mount Pantano. Uh, the whole fighting in Italy uh, did not achieve what it was supposed to be. So around the winter, starting in late December, high command forced the attacks, mm -hmm. and the and the attacks, you know. All the odds favored the enemy. All the odds. Mount Pantano was a huge thing. It was so big it practically dominated our whole sector. Way up there. All the advantages favored them. Would you tell us about being wounded? Am I getting wounded? Yes, sir. Well, I, uh, I was in a jeep, and we were—we had just been moved from that Pantano sector to the casino sector, and we had just gotten new guns. Now, now we had 
eight inch howitzers is a big, big thing. And I was going down a road to, uh, you know, get set up an o new OP, and I had my captain was with me, and the road was, you know, exposed, wide open. When I went down the road, I could see Monte Cassino. I could see the whole valley down below. And we got fired on. And uh, they, they hit the jeep, of course. The jeep came to a stop, and the captain, he, he really, you know, he had been back at the gun so long, he didn't realize what this was. I think he thought it was a flat tire. But I had been all the time, you know, up front. I knew we'd been hit by a shell. And he, he just was stumbled. I could still see him. He turned to me, and uh, he's drowsily, he says, uh, what's wrong, Smitty? And I pushed him out the side of the Jeep, away from where I thought the shell was coming. And we ran. And there was a little path. And we uh, ran up that path. <laughs> was an abandoned German dugout we went in. And they had a door, even a door. And the, the mountain sloped like this, and the door was right in here. And we went inside. Whoever fired at us saw us go. And he, he was determined to get us, because he fired. I, I, my ear became attuned. I, I knew. I don't care what other gun and shooting was going on. I knew that gun, and I could hear poop way off, and the shell would come. And he was trying to knock that door in, I think. And he wanted to put the shell right in. And I was determined he wasn't going to do that. And although I was wounded, I hadn't gone into shock yet. I crawled over each time and closed the door. And when we were rescued, he had the top hinge of the door off, and the door was hanging this way, but he never got that shell inside. Go back a minute to the, the jeep hitting, uh, getting hit. I take it at that moment, uh, that's when you were hit too. Yes. How badly were you hit? Well, I got sliced through here, one along my neck here, one along my leg, and a piece went right in to my leg, but missed the bone. So I could run. How about your captain? My, nothing. Nothing? Nothing. Not a thing. And when the explosion took place, my head seemed like it swelled up, and I started to black out. I was aware of blacking out and reaching a point and then coming to again. I think my body is pretty resilient. I had a watch on. And years later, the watch in my barracks bag, my barracks bag followed me to Cushing Hospital, and I opened up all that moldy stuff and everything, and, and I found a watch. So I went to a jeweler in downtown Framingham, and I said, oh, could you fix this watch? And he says, well, he looked it over and he says, this watch has been in a terrific explosion. <laughs> and all the stuff is wrecked in there. And look at that, that, that watch was wrecked by the shell explosion, and yet my head, my head, I mean, my, I didn't pass out. Remarkable how resilient your body is. Why didn't you bleed to death? I, I, they, they wanted to take me out of that dugout, and I didn't want to go. I wanted to stay there till nightfall, and then creep out. But these two medics came in. As soon as, they, as soon as they came in the door, I noticed they didn't have a gun. But for the longest time, I never realized that they were medics, because they, they were not in the least bit afraid of going out again, because we went, they carried me out. Right next to our bang jeep, they had their jeep. But it was marked with a cross, you know, red cross. 
and whoever that enemy was, he uh, stood by the, the code. I call it the code. You know, and he, he did, did not, not fire, fire on that. us. Yeah. He did not. He let us go. I thought if I thought for years, I thought it was just he saw the bravery of my captain who held one side of the door. They put me on the door, and the two guys were. He saw the bravery of them and let them go, but I think now they were medics and we got out. I'm going to follow you uh, in a second as a wounded man, but we talked about something just a few minutes ago that I think it, it, it's quite historic and I'd like to get it on the record. You said you saw the bombing of Mount Cassino, yeah. Monte Cassino. I, Would you tell us about that? Well, the, the, that mountain was not in our sector. The front is divided into s mm -hmm. sections. Each division has a sector. So I, I would be unable to say whether the Germans were using that Monica scene or not. The army said they're using it. They're up in the windows. Mm -hmm. They're using it. If they're not using it for gun, they're using it for observation. They're putting an artillery observer up there, and he's looking over the valley and picking out any number of things. He could have picked out my Jeep going down, although it was a good distance. So uh, actually, uh, the issue of Bona Casino, I wouldn't be able to say whether they used it or not, because I was not in that sector. All I know is that they were going to bomb it, and word came down that it was going to be the next morning. So I got myself into a place where I could see it from my mountain. I could see the airplanes. And I could see some of the walls going down. But, Describe uh, this uh, fleet of airplanes coming well, along. There was no opposition. Yeah. I don't even think the Germans fired at them, although they probably had any, any uh, aircraft guns, but I don't remember any fire at them. And they just flew over it, boom, just dropped them and dropped them and dropped them. With what result? What happened? Uh, well, that, that's what I was talking in there about. Uh, they created a lot of rubble. Uh, if, if you could, uh, in Italy, everything, they had no wood in Italy. They had no wood. Uh, sometimes we would we would move into a little village and go into a house there. And they all had fireplaces, but you had no wood to burn. So you know what we burned? Tables, chairs, uh, ca cupboards. We burned people's furniture. I know that sounds awful. We burned the inside of that church. Down to the floorboards were gone, the pews. That's pretty hard to burn a pew. <laughs> That's really hard. But with a little gasoline, which we had plenty of, uh, you start a little fire. And of course, at dusk, you had to put the fire out. But the uh, enemy must have known we were in that church. But uh, let's see, I got off the track there. That's OK. You were telling uh, <laughs> us about the result of the bombing of yeah. Monte Cassino. Yeah, it created rubble. I saw some of the walls half, still half up, see. So uh, if, if you could, in any place in Italy, if you could shell and, and flatten it, you know, just flat, that the enemy couldn't use it, it would be one thing, but that never happened. You shelled a village and you created all this rubble. And the enemy could put a machine gun behind the rubble and it's just as good as Mm -hmm. being in the building. And so that's what I felt happened up there. The, G the Germans claimed, claimed, no, no, we're not using it. But I, I figured that if it's usable, they used it. Okay, I, I interrupted you a minute oh. ago. You are on a door <laughs> being carried yeah. out uh, by your captain and yeah. these uh, two Red Cross uh, yeah. medics. And they, uh, where did they take you? Did they? The, the vehicle, their vehicle was pointed away. Our vehicle was pointed this way. 
if they put me on it, they wanted to take me to a first aid station, which was down in the direction I'd been going. I didn't want to go there, but by this time I was in shock. And, and I tried to yell and I tried to talk, but I, all I got was a mumble. But the determined feature figure determined what determined was, they would have had to put me on Jeep and turned around. And I, you're gambling on that German officer not firing, but is he going to sit there and watch us back up? And it was a narrow mountain road and turn around. So they just took me up the hill. As soon as we got up the hill and got out of sight, I was happy. My mind starts saying, you know, you're out of it. You're out of it. I, I always felt, that, you know, you, you just cannot keep going and nothing happened to you. Sooner or later, you're going to get yours. I was your reaction that, that this was the $100 wound and you were going home? <laughs> is, is that what you're saying? Yeah. I figured that one, I just can't go on forever without getting hurt. Something's going to, it is, just isn't working. I, this isn't going to work. And this was it. I didn't know whether I was going to get sent home, but I already had made a calculation on how much I was hurt. And the bleeding was, blood was dripping off my finger onto my boot, but it wasn't gushing. If it had been gushing, then I would have been worried. But my wounds, I even ran on my leg. So I figured, you knew hey. you, you knew you were gonna live, oh, yeah. but you were out of the war, at least temporarily. Yeah. So where did they take you now? Yeah, I went to a, I went to a, a French hospital, field hospital, wow, you know, with a big red cross on it. I went to a field hospital, but it was a French hospital, and they didn't want to keep me there. So they gave me, they marked me and whatnot, and they put me in an ambulance. <laughs> they put me in an ambulance. There was another guy in the ambulance with me. But the surprising thing is, a young French girl came out and she was the driver. Oh, she was cute. And you guys hijacked the ambulance. <laughs> <laughs> no, and she got in and, and said something in French, I don't know. And then she started driving, but she didn't know where the American hospital was in, because it was in another sector, see. So uh, she'd ask on the road, <laughs> you know, the GIs, pretty girl. They'd go over and, and uh, she'd roll down the ambulance and they'd get, you know, you know, and then they'd pretend they knew a little French, which they didn't know, and they'd start, uh, you know, making out, trying to just at least talk to her. And you're in the and back. And I started finally, <laughs> you know, I started yelling. And then they, it happened more than once, but they got me to the American hospital. I got in an American hospital. It, you know, all that time I felt fine, and then they rushed me into, into a, a, the field hospital operating room, and that was something. That was really something. There were, there must have been 10 operating tables, and each table had a team a doctor or maybe a second doctor and nurses were running all over the place and it was like mass production you know they shot me and I passed out and I went to one of these teams but there were other wounded being brought in all the time where were they coming from Jim you you had been Somewhere shot else, in an yeah. isolated incident was there another battle going oh, on yeah. at the same well, you, time? Oh, yeah. You had casino down the bottom of that hill. Yeah. And there was always somebody coming from them. Now, are you s totally separated from your outfit and you're not yeah. sure you're ever going to see it again? No, that's Did right. you feel pretty much alone at this time? I what were your feelings felt about happy. that? Yeah. I felt pretty happy. You were pretty happy. Yeah, and then when I woke up and they had me. They had plaster all the way up to my elbow and plaster all over my leg. 
I went crazy because before they took me in the operating room, I knew I was, I felt I was going to be fine. And now, <laughs> Look what pretty the serious. heck is this? Yeah. I start going crazy. They finally had it. They probably had. They finally had to give me a sedative to calm me down. But, uh, Did you just describe that you had gotten good medical care? Though? Yes, I did. Oh, I thought the army did a great job for me. Was this a kind of mash outfit? <laughs> no, this was bigger. The field hospital would be more like mash. But this was a uh, no, real hospital. No, no, the first aid station would be more like, well, MASH would be like this, too. This was much bigger than MASH. This was big and had a, a big tent, and over the top of the tent was a big Red Cross. The at Germans never did at it. At any point were you aware of the fact that you had gone through triage, that somebody looked at you and decided you were worth, worthy of being healed, that you were not dying? Yeah. Were you aware of that moment in your life that somebody said left no. hand or right hand? No. No, I, you know, right after we went over the hill, I knew I was going to be alive and I was going to be... But I mean, did there. some medical person no. make that decision no. about you? No. No, okay. No. I've often wondered, uh, you know, some guys were aware of the fact that they oh, were pointed in the wrong direction. No, never. No. Okay, you now you're all covered with plaster <laughs> and casts. And what did they do with you well, then? Well, they uh, when I woke up a second time after the sedation, I was a little more calmer, and then they got a doctor, and he sat on the end of my cot and told me that by immobilizing the wound, um, it heals faster. Okay, I accepted that. Then they cut it. Then I went to Naples Hospital. There was a big hospital in Naples. Now I was out of the field, and it was, you know, So you wards. went back down south uh, yeah, that's right, to Naples. Yeah, down to Naples. Yeah. And then the... And I had a lot of pain. And the pain seemed to all to be in my hand. But the wound was up here. And I used to lay all day thinking sorry for myself. And uh, had some crazy notion about taking any kind of sedative. And I stayed awake all day so because I didn't want to be laying there all night, you know, all alone like. You knew too that your family had been notified. Yes, they had been notified. Wounded in action. My mother got one of those yeah. telegrams delivered by a soldier. Imagine how she felt. Is there any way you could communicate with your family as to the I extent wrote of your with my wounds? left hand. Yeah. I tried to get a letter out as fast as possible. Just uh, one of those email things just to uh, Warn her, because she's gonna. I was afraid she's gonna get one of those telegrams, which just said. I even got the telegram at home. It said your son has been seriously wounded, and she would know nothing. So I tried to write, and she could tell by my writing with my left hand, you know, the curve of my writing that something. But but that I was doing pretty good. Now, when we op opened this interview, we, we <laughs> yeah. said that you wanted to talk about the uh, hospital experience. Yeah. Uh, let's not forget the other half of that, the combat fatigue part of it. So you, you go right on with your story and, and look at your notes there. Yeah, I, uh, uh, combat fatigue is kind of a nebulous thing. That, I don't think anybody understands, and I don't know that I do either. But uh, you know, it was always a, a, a like a contest, which was the best service. You know, the Air Corps, with all their glamour and uh, uniforms, and uh, you know that soft hat and the wings, and the dog soldier, the frontline soldiers. 
And uh, I had a chance in the beginning there, the Air Corps wanted men, wanted them badly. And a lot of my friends volunteered and went into the Air Corps. But uh, I had made my mother a promise. Somehow she had the idea that flying was the worst. So she made me promise I'd never, well, I don't know whether that had anything to do with it, but I didn't sign up for the Air Corps. But I always felt that mentally, uh, the Air Corps had the worst of it. Uh, uh, an Air Corps officer, he's going to live far away from the battle. He's going to live maybe in England or down at Foggy in Italy. He's going to live somewhat like he lived at home. He's going to have girlfriends. He's going to have parties. He's going to go on tours. He's going to have a good life when he's not flying. Where, and when he gets in his plane and flies, then he's in real danger. And, it, and I felt that would be hard for me to adjust to. Going from a soft, nice, easy life and every day getting an airplane and flying. And, and the Air Corps, uh, it didn't matter whether you were a good flyer or a poor flyer. Uh, it was just a matter of luck. You just flew through the ack ack, just flew along, and the enemy planes attacked you. You had, you had no way of, uh, of uh, protecting yourself, and no way of uh, perhaps doing something that could save you by being clever or smarter or something. You, not, you just flew right through. And if you came back, wonderful. If you went down, down in flames, as you used to say. Where the dog soldier, he leaves home, and he's gone from home. And he's never going to come back until this thing is over. And he's going to, yes, he's going to die in a mud on a field somewhere, which isn't quite as exciting as coming out of the air on a huge explosion when they hit the ground. But, he's, uh, but he, he can adjust to war conditions better. He, he, he's, he's taken out of the front lines, it's true, from time to time. But he doesn't go any great place when he's out of the front lines, just like a little rest area. Then he goes back in. So he really never comes out of the war until he gets wounded, killed, captured, or rotated home. Let's, let's pursue the, the idea of combat fatigue in this sense. Uh, com, com, combat fatigue, uh, the best way to understand it is dead. Dead, you see dead soldiers. Uh, that's, uh, one one uh, thing that impressed me a great deal was this dead Moroccan soldier who had his shoes were taken off. And I, I passed him every day, and he was shrinking, he was frozen. But you know, that, that weighs on your mind. Uh, in, in Africa, the first hill we were on, there was a whole bunch of troops there. And when they, on Easter morning, they jumped off against the enemy, and I could see from the hill, I could see some of my friends, you know, falling down. And uh, no matter how you denied it, you 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 felt that uh, you know someday that's going to be you. And and you can just you can just take so much of this, and it starts to work on you. Um, we we made a. General Patton made a little landing in Sicily, and I was part of it. And we had two tanks on this little ang ang uh, landing craft. And we were not experienced about getting these tanks into this landing craft. We had a terrible time. And the two tanks were sitting there waiting, because they would be the 
last one on the little ship and the first one off. And they helped us and they laughed and talked with us all night long. And uh, we didn't get away till about three o'clock, so when we went to the landing place, it was broad daylight, and the two tanks went right off, and our trucks and guns followed, and the first, I can't understand this, but the first gun that came off, of course, where did the truck go? Right down in the sand. And uh, I don't know how we had ever solved this thing. And all this brass was standing there yelling. And I was the f first one to realize what had to be done. I had to get one of those tanks to come back. And I ran across the area and got the second tank. I ran, I caught up to the tank. I took my rifle and banged on the side of the tank. You know, stop. They couldn't even hear me, so I ran around the front and they stopped and I pointed to the back and they pulled them off. But the first tank was gone down the road. And when we got the guns off, the colonel said, Smitty, get in your Jeep and go up ahead and see if you can find the infantry and let us know what's going on. I went up the road. I came around the turn of the road and I saw the tube of a tank facing me. And I knew it was enemy tank. The the driver jammed on the brakes and we dove out of the tank, out of the Jeep, went around and tried to use the Jeep as a barrier, you know. And I was starting to get up to hold up my hand to surrender to that tank. Then it, nothing had happened. And I noticed now that the tube was not aimed at us. It was aimed to the side. So my eyes followed along where that tube was pointing. And here was a tank. Tank was knocked out. The German tank, it's, it's something like a movie. Who would ever think of something like this happening? The two tanks were oh, 20 yards away and they each had knocked the other one out. See, a tank travels with a, with a shell in it all times. And the only person that knew I called that a three-second tank battle. There was a hole in the American tank right below the tube where the driver would sit, and there was a hole in the German tank, and the German tank was much bigger. And there was still some smell and smoke coming out. I'd say this happened about an hour before I got there. They had both fired at the same time, That's, you're that's right. The yeah. only way it could have happened. And the only guy that could have done it is the... Is the lanyard man. He pulls the lanyard that causes a pin to strike and the shell flies. Well I went over and the men in both tanks were laying on the ground. The infantry had gone and pulled them all out to see if there's anybody to save. So I walked along there and there were six guys of ours laying there. I better drink of water right they, now. They were the six guys that had s stood there the night before. This was the tank that had sailed that over. That was the with first you. one. That was the first tank, yeah. and they, they were all laying on the ground there. I even had to, in order to move, I, my driver was was useless. I sent him back. He he couldn't drive no more. He he was cracked up completely. So I even had to pull some of their bodies a little over so I could go around them and continue up the road. Then, then as I drove, you know, each turn of the road, my God, you know, I, I didn't know, maybe they sent the second tank. That German tank was meant to get us and get that ship that was sitting there while they were unloading. That's what tank Germans had sent that tank, and our little tank had stopped it. And I was thinking those guys, you know, they should be heroes. But then I had to go on. I, I went around each bend in the road, 
scared to death. And I finally found the infantry. Thank goodness I found them first and not the enemy, because I should never have been out on the road. You know, you see movies of patrols going down the road, men walking. Here I was in a jeep. But then, then, uh, then I think the biggest blow for me, I told you my greatest fear was an enemy patrol. I never, I never picked up any German wristwatches, never touched a German dead, nothing, no souvenirs on me, because if that German patrol catches you and you got a German wristwatch on, that German patrol can kill you if they want, just as easy as not. And that's what I feared. Anyway, I stayed up there, and sometimes I would go down to the infantry to see what was going on, because I was very much concerned. <laughs> they're, my, they're my front, you know. And they were all upset. Four of their men were caught by a German patrol the night before and were bayoneted in their sleeping bags. Bayoneted, you know what a bayonet is? They were bayoneted and couldn't even get out and killed right inside their sleeping bags. And the infantry were all upset. They called that cruel, inhumane. And for a period of about a week, it was known along that front no prisoners would be taken. And somehow the enemy knew no prisoners would be taken. Something atrocious happened, Some, something statistical. Like there was another incident where they, they took an American soldier and filled his legs, shot his legs all up and left him for dead. Now that's inhumane and for that area for about a week, no prisoners. Can, can we go back and link something that you said oh, 45 minutes ago, and we're now discussing uh, combat fatigue. Your feeling when you were being carried on that door and they finally got you over that hill, and you knew you were out of it, is this part of it that combat fatigue it, it is, the cure for it is the realization that finally you're through with this and that you could, you don't have to take it anymore. Yeah. Well, that's, that's when you come out of it, like, that's when, you, when, you're, when you're saved. But you, also, uh, you also wanted to talk about hospital experience. Yeah. Uh, where did you go from, you were last uh, in a, a large American hospital. Yeah. Uh, and you told me earlier that you, you were home and back in the States before D-Day. So that's June of 44. Yeah. Uh, and you went into the army in May of 42. So within a year, you had gone through all this in Italy. Mm -hmm. And now, how, how did you start the process of going home? Oh, I, I was in the hospital. But let me tell you, this, this bayoneting thing, you know, I, I kind of wish they hadn't told me this. Because for the next month, I slept with that idea and that worry. And that really took a toll on me. Yes. You know, I, I, start, I started uh, talking to myself. I, I uh, you know, I, I, it, it, it affected me in, in a, in a I, I used to be, in the beginning, I was kind of cocky. You know, it's not going to happen to me now. I was getting just the opposite, and and I went from from that hill to a couple more hills, and then to a one way up, where I really was uh, cracking up. I I I couldn't stay up on the hill without I constantly looking around. I was sure they were going to send somebody to get me, and uh, I picked up the phone more than once to ask for relief. But I put it down. I, I felt I couldn't ask for relief with the infantry 
and what they had to put up with. I just couldn't do that. And, w and when I finally, eight days I was up there, coming up and down. I was up in the snow, I couldn't sleep up there. But every day I'd go up, oh, dreading it. And up there on the mountain, I dreaded it. I, I would come up the next morning early in darkness, and I'd lay in the snow, and I'd look around, see if anything was disturbed, see if there was any footprints, anything to show that the enemy had been there. It was really getting to me. I didn't, I didn't, I, that was kind of unnatural. I shouldn't have had that kind of fear. And I shook. You know, I couldn't get warm. And eight days I did that up and down. And as soon as it got a little bit of dusk, I'd call in, I'm coming down. And I literally dove in the snow to get down as fast as I could. But uh, that was the last OP I had to be on. Thank God, thank God. But I was in the hospitals and uh, I was in a little hospital ship and we were in enemy waters and it had a big, it was a, it was a very small ship now. There was about six of us on this little hospital ship. But to get out of Italy. You were leaving Naples? Yeah, I had to, I had to prove, they, they said I had to be ambulatory, which means I had to walk. And the sooner I walked, the sooner I would go. And uh, I did lay there and baby myself. I babied myself. I used to pull this arm in like this, and you know, don't, don't touch me, don't touch me. Well, this, we had a nurse there. Her name was Martha. She was a little older than us, and uh, she used to treat a, treat the soldiers like they were her kids, you know. And one day she zeroed in on me. She came over to my cot and she says, uh, what do you got there? <sighs> my arm, my hand hurts. Let me see it. No, no, it's gonna hurt. I remember her. Oh, she said, your hand isn't wounded. Your hand's fine. It's up there in the arm. Let me have it. She reads it, pulls it out. See, she said, that doesn't hurt. And it didn't. My hand was all swollen, skin was coming off, it looked terrible. And she says, uh, I bet you can't straighten your arm out. And I couldn't. And she started pulling on it. Oh. She says, I'm going to get a pan of water and we're going to wash that hand. And then all the while she washed my hand, she says, I'm coming back every day and I'm going to get this hand and your arm in shape. And she'd come back every day. And all the while, she was washing my hand. She was, uh, you know, saying, uh, you're, you're a baby. I'm not a baby. You're a baby. You're babying yourself. You're laying here. Your, your whole body's deteriorating. Wake up. You know, listen to other people. Take part in what's going on. She kept at it, at it every day. She pulled me out my... This was Martha. Yeah, and yeah. one day, she was reassigned, gone. Never saw her again. Where did you sail to on was, this little ship? Yeah, I don't know where it was in North Africa. They but took in North you back Africa, to North Africa? Yeah, we went back to North Africa. And there, you went back on empty ships. <clears throat> Well, they weren't totally empty, but they were empty ships. And uh, uh, they took prisoners back with it. They took German prisoners back to the States. I guess they figured it was cheaper to feed them back here. I think you had some prisoners in, the, in Framingham area. But they brought them back, and, and we were loaded on that. But North African prison uh, hospital. I saw the worst case, unbelievable. This kid, his tank, you know, somehow everybody has an idea that tank, 
What a glorious thing to ride around in a tank. Oh no. A tank's a death trap. And they usually don't get out. But this poor guy was the only member of a tank crew that got out. And he was burnt. Unbelievable. He was black. Everything black. His face, his, his nose was a, a little, a little nothing really. His ears were gone. No hair, of course. His skin was shriveled, like, like it looked like wax. And way back in there somewhere were his eyes, his mouth, and, and his body, he had a house coat on, like a, a bed, uh, bed gown, and his legs were black, his feet, his hand looked like a claw. Oh, I didn't, after I seen him once, I didn't want to go over to his ward, because I couldn't stand seeing that poor kid. And he was up, he had one of those walkers with four legs, and he was shuffling along. And he would, he, when, I, when I saw him, I, I, you know, I tried to get by, and he, he would reach out with that hand, and he put it on my arm like, and he stopped me. Of course, I stopped. And he looked me right in the eye, and he raised the other hand just a little, you know, like he was saying, I'm all right. Oh, he wasn't all right. I even, I even thought maybe it'd been better if they, you know, don't try to save him. I don't know what they're going to do with, with a guy like that. Then we had, a, that's why I say this African hospital, oh, worse, banged up kids. It, it, we had a guy there, his legs were gone here. He must have tripped a mine. His legs were gone here. And what I remember odd about him. He did not want to be down on the ground. Did not want to be crawling around like that on the ground. He, 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 he had a, a pair of crutches, and he used to vault from bed to bed. And then he used to say, uh, he used to say, uh, I'm going to get legs. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk. And we had another soldier who, who picked up an a Italian grenade, blew his fingers off, he, and he had like a claw. And I remember asking him, you know, you don't pick up nothing. What's wrong with you? Stupid, he said, oh, stupid. And we had another guy with a drop, a drop foot, been wounded somewhere in the leg, and he was determined he was going to walk right, and he would trip over rugs, sometimes trip and fall. He'd get up swearing to himself because he wanted to be, you know, just like everybody else. Then we had a guy who, those are, these are the guys that I remember being the worst. We had a guy who was a pilot in a little cub plane, and it had crashed. And he was in, in there, and he was in there a long time. And the legs were, I don't know how many times his legs were broken, you know, how many places, and they weren't healing. And top of all that, he was gaining weight. And you'd go by his, you'd go by his bed, and you could see him, you know, crying. Silently crying. Better not, better not to go by his bed, because it just made you feel terrible. And at Cushing Hospital, I was in a ward with. Uh, Cushing is here in Massachusetts. Yeah, I was in a ward. Away. Yeah, Cushing was a neuro center. If you had some, some neuro problem had to do with nerves, or head brain or something like that, uh, this was a specialty place. And we had some awful cases. We had kids, kids who 
had been so close. They had a dent in their skull where a shell or something had taken part of the skull away. And they had a wavy skull and they would come to Framingham, Cushing, to put a new plate in. We had a whole group of them, maybe about four of them. And we had guys that just <clears throat> sat there all day, just looking off into space. How and, long were you at, at Cushing? Oh, that's where I was discharged from. Is that I guess the, about six months or so. And you got out of the Army in 45? Four, yeah, about 45. 45. But these kids, uh, I, I often wondered, you know, why, why am I in this ward? You know, I only have a, a little problem with my hand, and by this time I, I can write, today I can write with both hands. When I write with my left hand, it, it's, the words are, the letters are a little angled the wrong way, but I can write very well. I used just to be able to tie my shoestring. Uh, that's quite a feat. But, Jim, uh, bef before we finish here today, we're, we're getting uh, into the tape yeah. toward the end of it. Is there any one incident that you recall, either uh, the worst, the best, uh, or a person that you could tell us about as we finish up here? Tell us about... Uh, uh, yeah, is there... When, when you go over all the things oh. you went through, is there one thing that comes back more than anything else that you remember? I, I remember uh, a couple of people that I will never forget. Tell us about that. And neither them. one of them was, was in the battle thing. When I first went into service, um, my first captain, in the, in the service was uh, a man they called Jawbone Smith. Jawbone? Jawbone Smith, because he talked so much. <laughs> he uh, wasn't a relative. He, uh, he was from the mountains somewhere and he had no education and he got into the army and by the age of 50 he was as far as he could go. Uh, and this, see, he never went overseas, but I remember him. He was about 50 years old and too old to go overseas. And when the war broke out, uh, the Army took experienced men and uh, made them into officers. Well, Jawbone uh, said that uh, they wanted to make him an officer with all his experience. So uh, he said, uh, you can only, uh, either I'm a captain or um, I don't want it. He was a sergeant major or something like that. Oh, I don't know. But he was a first class character and from his army experience, he, uh, you know, he, he showed disrespect. He was very crude. He was obnoxious. And I liked him. <laughs> he had a chip on his shoulder. He was a little guy, and uh, he had a mouthful of teeth that went all different directions. Uh, and he was a first-class character, and he gave me my platoon when nobody else, as a second lieutenant, got a platoon, and that that platoon was the happiest experience that I had in the Army. And uh, when people found out that Jawbone was my captain, they, they thought, oh, you're in for a terrible time, because he showboated. And yet, with, with me, he never, he never uh, did this. Oh, I, I don't know. Anyway, I remember him. Would you do something for us at the end of this tape that I would appreciate? This is, this is your bronze star yeah. that was presented to you. 
Would you read the citation? Me? Yeah. Do you mind doing this? Because I think it sums up a lot of what you've told us today, but also it sums up the recognition that the United States Army knew you were out there. Would you do that for us, Jim? It says here, award a Bronze Star Medal. Under the provisions of Article War 600-45 as amended, the following officer has been awarded a Bronze Star Medal. First Lieutenant James A. Smith for meritorious, meritorious service in combat during the period between 25th of October 43 to 8th of February 44 in Italy, Lieutenant Smith exhibited initiative, meticulous care, and a high degree of professional skill while performing his duties as a former observer along the Italian front. In order to obtain the best observation possible, he was often subject to enemy fire of all types and endured lack of sleep and the severest weather conditions for extended periods. While the battle for Mount Pantano was in progress, First Lieutenant Smith maintained his observation post in freezing weather to enable his battalion to mass fire on enemy attacks and to obtain valuable information of enemy dispositions. The numerous achievements of First Lieutenant Smith beyond the call of duty are in keeping with the high tradition of the armed forces. Home address, Cincinnati, Ohio, by order of Colonel Beck. Okay. Jim, thank you very much All right. for being with us thank today. Thank you. I appreciate <laughs> your coming back in. Well.